Coming up on Market to Market, Big Packer Gridlock sends producers scrambling. Seafood profits sink as the lockdown continues. Some of these commodities are oversold. And market analysis with Elaine Cobb next. Who's saying, oh, well, What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, May 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The economy is showing the first signs of a recession as farm and ranch country continue to feel the squeeze of a drop in demand. The pressure is building on hog producers who are caught between the barn and the packing house door. They remain stuck in line waiting for processing plants to reopen as backlog builds. Josh Bittner and Colleen Bradford Krantz have our coverage. Once the fear gets out into the community and people start to do the same thing to the meat supplies as they did to toilet paper, uh, you're going to see the shelves bare fairly quickly. Okay. This week, the Trump administration classified you, the American children. meat processing industry as critical infrastructure, mandating continued operations despite a surge in COVID-19 among the workforce. The quarantine is going to be very strong. And we're going to make people better when they have a problem. We're going to get them better. The president's liability-minded executive order drew union backlash as sick employees have led to supply chain disruptions for the world's largest meat companies, halting production at roughly 20 plants and slaughterhouses across North America. Before the coronavirus started, we were headed to record production this year, record large beef production. Our cattle numbers had peaked. You know, it's, it's a cyclical industry. Texas A&M agricultural economist David Anderson says as the government looks to slowly revamp the supply chain, beef volume and variety will decrease while grocery bills rise. He says cattlemen could see prices rally, but stress another link in the supply chain. Just as we see this bottleneck take hold in packing and processing, so not only do we have grocery store demand for meat, now we're going to see, you know, if places reopen, increasing demand from the restaurant sector just when we can't get any more supplies of beef through the system to get to them. And that means even higher prices for meat for our restaurants that have been struggling so much already. While around 10 percent of beef production has been impacted by the virus, pork production has been hit significantly harder especially in the nation's top hog producing state. Just in Iowa, we're, we're estimating that there's uh, about 40,000 pigs per day that are, are not um, going to market that should be. The reality is it's just a drop in the bucket compared to the magnitude of the backlog that we're generating here. And Iowa Pork Producers Association President Mike Postian really says farmers have sold pigs via social media donated to food pantries, or simply given the animals away, all to avoid the looming specter of euthanasia. I can tell you, speaking for myself personally and, and all other producers, I mean, that is literally the, the last option. And we're going to keep doing everything we can up until that moment to try to prevent that from happening. Austin finds Trump's move to keep processors open encouraging and praises the federal response in recent weeks, along with state-level coordination. But he sees a daunting challenge in sheer swine numbers backed up on farms. It's still going to take time for, for plants to come back online, and when they do, they won't be running at full capacity, most likely. Short of every single person in Iowa taking a pig and processing it in their backyard, there's just no way to absorb this kind of massive disruption. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz in Winterset, Iowa. The nation's butcher shops have been unusually busy since March. But with some large packing plants closed temporarily to deal with COVID-19 among workers, these small lockers have been overwhelmed with requests for butchering services and direct-to-consumer meat purchases. 
Kirkpatrick Locker in Winterset, Iowa, which processes about a dozen hogs and a dozen cattle each week, had to place a five-pound limit on hamburger purchased in their front-of-store retail area. So we've never had a limit on our ground show, which is right here, and we had to put an order on five pounds because we have people come in wanting 30, 40 pounds at a time, and we just said you just need enough to get through the week until we can get more so everyone can get it. Even with the limit, larger-than-normal sales are depleting the supply from the shop's refrigerator cases. Area farmers, who normally wouldn't bring many animals in for butchering this time of year, are filling up the shop's calendar for customers wanting to stock up. Livestock producers from outside the area are calling as well. As of early this week, Kirkpatrick Locker didn't have any openings to process animals until fall. Anita Meat Processing, 55 miles away in Anita, Iowa, said it has never been so busy and as of midweek was fully booked until late January 2021. Kirkpatrick Locker has had to turn down larger producers looking for openings while some major packing plants are closed down. Yeah, we got a couple calls yesterday, um, some big some big people that were wanting to bring in, you know, semi-trailers full, and we, we just don't have the capability to do that many packing plants. They'll do 30,000 in a day. And just Saturday, there was one from Wisconsin, they were about eight hours mm-hmm. away, that they wanted to bring a truckload down. According to the USDA, the nation still had more than 1.1 billion pounds of frozen red meat in storage as of March 31st, 7% more than was ready and waiting a year ago. At that same time, the U.S. also still had 1.3 billion pounds of frozen poultry. Although these numbers do not account for any sales out of that surplus in recent weeks, experts say it is still a decent safety net assuming enough larger plants are able to continue operating. The Wagners said if consumers stay calm and don't aggravate problems by hoarding, it's the livestock producers who have the most immediate concern. I got a call Saturday where a guy said he had 4,000 pigs and he didn't brought down here that day, otherwise the farmer's gonna shoot them all. I'm like, well, we can't fit 4,000 hogs here. And I wish we could, but there's nothing we can help with there. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Rural America continues to get hit in the wallet as demand for their products plunge and cascades to all parts of the economy. The damage can be seen in the latest economic numbers. First quarter GDP plummeted 4.8 percent, the biggest slide since the depths of the Great Recession. Creighton University's Mid-America Index tumbled over 16% to 35.1, the lowest level since February 2009. The Fed will leave interest rates alone but continue to buy Treasury and mortgage bonds. Chair Powell urged Congress to spend as much as necessary to help workers and businesses until a recovery of some kind can be achieved. The impact on the food industry is deep and efficiencies are being strained from feedlot to ocean view. Seafood producers, processors, and purveyors are feeling the pinch from pond to plate. John Torpy has more. Since 2002, Dave Roebuck has been farming oysters in Rhode Island. By 2018, he had expanded his business to include a seed stock operation and raw oyster bar food truck. Last year, Robux business was booming, and his sales helped add to the tally of 8 million oysters purchased in the state of Rhode Island. This year, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the seafood market just as hard as any other part of the economy. We're not doing too good, I'll tell you. Um, yeah, we went, um, we, we, you know, our spring is when markets really turn on. That's really when demand picks up for us and it follows through May, June, July, all the way through the summer. Roebuck has a 60,000 oyster stockpile that he holds during the winter to help meet springtime demand. When states began shutting down bars and restaurants to combat the pandemic, Roebuck watched that demand dry up. From my markets in Rhode Island all the way down to D.C., it was 
you know, in a matter of a week or two and everything was just, it went from 100% to about 10%. With traditional markets closed, producers like Roebuck are trying to launch a direct-to-consumer sales website as a way to make ends meet. Restaurants in the Midwest featuring seafood are seeing some of the same problems as their New England counterparts. Sean Hankey, owner of Waterfront Seafood in West Des Moines, Iowa, had just received a fresh stockpile of time-sensitive inventory a day before the shutdown. I had fresh halibut from Alaska. I had uh, some aquanor from Iceland. And I had another shipment, oh, two tunas from Louisiana. All of them came after we had to shut down. But I couldn't stop them. I mean, they were already on their way. For Hanke, taking advantage of the newly refilled PPP program has helped him reopen his restaurants for a modified curbside pickup business. But takeout alone isn't a recipe for revenue recovery. We're going to hope that the governor goes into phase one, which is opening sit-down restaurants with distance, which we think will probably be six feet. And I figure I'll have, I'll lose about 60% of my seats, but that's still better than all carry out for us. We need to get reopened fully as quick as possible, uh, but safely. So, you know, I think everybody understands that. You see the numbers go the wrong way. You know, everybody's gonna have to just shut back down and close back up. The bill is passed. The CARES Act, passed in late March, injected $300 million into the seafood and fishing industries. The money will soften some of the blow, but Hanky and Roebuck will have to wait and see how much it will offset their lost sales. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market report. Renewed Chinese buying collided with good planting weather and profit-taking, leaving the commodity markets mixed. For the week, July wheat fell 14 cents and the nearby corn contract lost a nickel. Late week purchases by China helped move the July soybean contract higher by a dime. July soybean meal weakened 10 cents per ton. July cotton gained 21 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, May Class 3 milk futures rallied 55 cents. A big week in the livestock sector. June cattle increased 462. August feeders put on $1.25, and the June lean hog contract jumped higher by 22%, or $11.17. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index declined 133. June crude gained 226 per barrel. Comex Gold dropped 32.30 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index added 8 points to finish at 250.40. Joining us now to offer insight on these and regular market trends is regular market analyst Elaine Cobb. Elaine, good to see you. Hello. Welcome from your home. And, uh, you know, the last time we saw you, Elaine, was early March. And I remember we had a conversation about how things were going to change. My, what an understatement that was. I want to first mix the format up here, throw you for a loop. We're going to start with the livestock industry. You told me earlier this week, we're going to have a lot of time on that, right? It's a big deal. So I want to start first. We have new people that are watching the show, hopefully. And they kind of understand packer margins. And many of us think we understand them. Quickly, what are they? And have any of the fundamentals on those packer margins changed here since the last two months? Yes, uh, hot topic, Paul. So the packer margins, if just looking at present market prices, would be implied to be about $700 per head. And that's $300 better than it was even a week ago. So that's $700 per head. Every uh, cattle, every cow, market animal that comes into a beef packing plant uh, is expected to bring that company $700. And the way that that works is just like a margin in any other industry, it's how much more can you sell a product for than you paid for it. And to get real specifics, the math of this is, let's say you have a 1,200 pound steer coming into a beef packing plant for which you pay $105 per hundredweight. That means you're paying $1,260 for that steer. Now the packers are gonna process that steer into meat, put that meat into boxes and sell it as a wholesale product. 
And it's this, this is the piece that has really changed recently. And it's because of the COVID-19 pandemic and people just, uh, you know, ravenous appetite for the meat at the grocery store. You're looking at boxed beef prices at $364 or hundred weight. So you take those 744 pounds of beef, you're not going to get the full 1200 pounds of the animal all processed into beef. There is a a margin of, because not all of a cow is going to turn into beef. You've got bones and water and waste. So 744 pounds, you're going to look at uh, $2,712 of final product. So between that that you're selling as product and that $1,200 some dollars that you paid for the animal, that's your margin, minus your costs of production, obviously. And those are going up right now because of the COVID p- pandemic. You know, it's more expensive to be running a processing plant when you have to take all of these measures to protect the workers. Right. So earlier this week, packer margins were up 40 percent, but slaughter was down 40 percent. Let's start with cattle here, Elaine. What is really happening in this market this week and next? Yeah, you're looking at daily slaughter numbers. About 80,000 head of cattle are being processed every day. Before this recession started or this lockdown recession started or before the health problems and the workers and the packing plants, that's really the, the, the factor here. Before that started, it was more like 115,000 of head being slaughtered every day. So the slowdown in cattle is significant, um, but we're seeing some of those plants coming online even next week. So the pain point isn't even here as much as it is uh, for the hogs. All right, feeder-wise, uh, we need to get a little more in-depth with cattle in Market Plus, and we will. The feeder problem, though, comes from the cattle problem, Elaine, because if you hold back and leave them in the lot, or all of a sudden August looks to be troublesome, or is it? Is it troublesome to you, August? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the uncertainty. It's not knowing what the capacity of the processing industry will be three months from now or six months from now. So somebody who's going to go out and buy feeder cattle right now really doesn't know when or if those cattle are going to reach market in a normal time frame. So honestly, this might be an opportunity for those calves that are coming to market right now, uh, people that would buy them and put them on grass. That's a real thing that could certainly be happening this summer, um, especially because lots of parts of the Corn Belt certainly have good pasture conditions. There's parts of the Western United States where drought is growing. But there could be a feeder market here. But again, that doesn't help. What you're talking about is not knowing down the road. Eventually, those animals are going to have to be fattened up. Right. All right. Hog wise, uh, this is, I think, rough math, $18 in two weeks up. Why? Well, it had to bottom out somewhere. And I think there's just a more familiarity of how much the demand is somewhat stable. I mean, these are, there is elasticity of demand for for meat, certainly, but it doesn't go away. And certainly globally, there is still, you know, appetite to pay something and certainly at the grocery store to pay something for this meat. All right, do you see this as, uh, if you're a hog producer, if you can't even find a place to take your animals, are you holding or what are you doing? Well, and, and they talked about this in the story at the top of your program, it's, it would be a terrible decision if the hogs can't go to market at all. And that, that, that has been the case. And it's because hogs uniquely almost as market animals um, can't really just be held indefinitely. They're not like dry grain that you can just store indefinitely until there's a market for them. They are somewhat perishable goods. And we saw that a few weeks ago with the milk being dumped because it can't reach a market in time. Hogs are kind of like that. If they get too large, they cannot be processed in the processing plants. Therefore, that's a real pain point in the industry. And, you know, it's really geographical, too. There's 73 packing hog processing plants in the United States, and seven of those are closed right now. And it's really sort of centered right around northwestern Iowa. So you're talking about eastern South Dakota and northwestern Iowa that uh, is really experiencing the, the least amount of throughput capacity for their animals. Back to the uh, grains. You talk about wheat a little bit, the dry grains. It wasn't dry. It's been dry in Europe. They got a little rain. Is that the biggest weight on the market right now? Yeah, I think from day to day, that wheat market, you see it fluctuate based on that weather forecast. And the weather forecast for the next 10 days, not just Europe, but going into Russia and Ukraine also, there is rain in that forecast. So we saw uh, the global wheat prices sort of pull back from day to day. You're talking about Chicago, Kansas City, and even the Paris wheat futures. But uniquely, Minneapolis wheat futures have not been behaving in the same way as those other bigger wheat futures markets are. They've just been trending lower day after day. We have a couple of good wheat questions we'll get to in Market Plus. Uh, Are you holding, buying, or selling right now on wheat? 
Well, I can understand why the Minneapolis wheat futures are moving lower. Let's talk about spring wheat specifically, and it's because there's more planting potential there. There's more motivation for farmers to get in there and plant that spring wheat instead of corn, just from the price ratio alone. I mean, you wouldn't think that $5 spring wheat is, is really motivating, but compared to $3.30 corn, I guess it is. So there is potential for more downward movement there, and it might be, uh, you know, this might be the best you can get. Corn was struggling uh, for a while this week, then came Thursday. Was this only end of the month uh, profit taking or was some, is something else in play here in corn? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to, uh, this week's, you know, a little bit of a jump in corn prices as anything uh, to write home about or get real excited about. I mean, I think the, the larger market factors, specifically the bearishness of ethanol and fuel usage in the United States and globally, that is just going to be... A kind of, well, not permanent, but a long-term drag on corn prices. That oil is something that uh, did rally. I think the last two days it's gone green. Why is corn so susceptible when it goes down, but it doesn't quite react on the way up to go up? Well, for, I just want to make a comment that it's not too hard for oil to go up from negative 40. <laughs> True. But uh, <laughs> Well played. Yeah, but for corn and for for ethanol and, and energy, all of this is because the news that's coming in is bearish. Is is as the market is is factoring in how long and how bad uh, the demand destruction may be. You know, the RFA this week came out with a study suggesting that for a whole calendar year, ethanol demand might be down 20 percent. So if you just back that off, 20 percent less ethanol means 20 percent less corn used in ethanol. That's a billion bushels. That's a billion bushels of corn for ethanol usage gone. Then you're talking about a 22% stocks to use ratio instead of a 15% stocks to use ratio. That's bearish. I mean, it doesn't have to be a linear uh, relationship in the prices. Prices don't have to go down just because the inventory gets slightly higher. Um, you know, if you have enough, you have enough, but it will always have value and it can be stored. This is dry yeah. grain. This isn't hogs. Right. You can store it until a market shows up. All right, real quick, I have to get in Phil from Ontario, Canada's question here. He's asking about December. He says, with December corn at 334 and with COVID-19 a constant, is the old adage of a high in mid-June out of the window this year? Is corn limiting wheat? Yeah, that seasonal expectation that we have is to see the higher prices in sort of May, June, July time frame. That's for normal years. That's for years when you have sort of a normal abundance of crops uh, and that's the pattern you see. But I want to say that 2020 is not a normal year. You know, 2012 wasn't a normal year. We had a, a drought, and so prices went up towards harvest. 2020, I believe, is going to be one of those years where you have a sudden crush of supply, or a sudden, in this case, sudden uh, collapse in demand. And it may very well be the case that we have seen the highs already for that new crop December corn contract. Those, by the way, were back in January 15th at like 404 and three quarters. Oh, for the winter the times that we would uh, like to talk about. Soybean-wise here, Elaine, uh, there was uh, news Thursday into Friday about uh, tough tariff talk, the president threatening more tariffs on China. They're just starting to buy. Is this going to jeopardize any or keep a lid on some of these rallies? Absolutely. So Thursday was a good day for the soybean market. 264,000 metric tons of soybeans were sold or were purchased by China. So that's good. That's great news. And we did see soybean markets move up 17 cents. But like you mentioned, then the headlines come back in. And it's like you say, just back in winter, where you have this kind of cat fight hitting and spitting between the United States and China. And that takes all the wind out of the sails of the idea that trade would be normalized, that that phase one trade deal would ever really come back into the picture. And so that certainly takes it all back out again. Well, it was something we talked about last week with Arlen. It was, you know, just when you thought they, were, they know a good deal. They came in and buy on the, on the low side of things. Uh, with soybeans this week, there was a purchase by Mexico, pretty small. But then these China rumors overnight, and then they are purchasing. So uh, I guess I'll ask long term here, are you selling that November contract or are you holding right now? Well, eight dollars and fifty cents isn't a level that anybody, you know, really appreciates. But that seasonal pattern again—it's the same for soybeans as for corn. If we're not going to see a, a high because of planting problems or because of weather problems in the summer, we don't know, perhaps. But the most likely expectation is if we're going to have this bearishness of supply or lack of demand carrying through with us all the way into fall, we would expect to see prices continue flat or lower all the way into fall. All right. I, uh, before we go, crude, you kind of talked about, do you see crude oil is hitting the bottom? Has it hit the bottom? 
Well, since we're we driving more, that's the only reason I asked that question. Since we seem to be driving more. Okay, so you're asking about demand because because price wise, we've suddenly discovered there is no bottom. You know, we all kind of thought that zero was the bottom for commodities. But if you have to try and find storage, uh, the futures contracts in delivery can go less than zero. So let's all keep that in mind. Um, and that could certainly happen again for the for the June crude oil futures contract, if we're just talking about the futures contract. But and demand, fuel demand, uh, let's hope that recovers, yes. All right. I should have said 30 seconds. Thank you, Elaine Cub. Good to see you. We'll see you in Market Plus in just a couple of minutes. That will wrap up the broadcast portion of the TV show we call Market to Market, but there is still more to talk about. We'll cover it in Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. They were great. Again, you can find it on the web at markettomarket.org. The Book of Faces, or Facebook, allows you to keep track of your favorites from rural America. We know that many of you have been missing racing. We have you covered in an, a, a wonderful video that was sent to us. Find it at, at our page at Market to Market Show. Join us again next week when we'll explore the effect of COVID-19 on rural grocery stores. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.